Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. Welcome to Ask the Experts Behind the Scenes of the LabCast. My name is Katrina Bray. I am one of the communications managers for the STEM faculty here at The Open University. Today, you're going to get an opportunity to get familiar with Stadium Live, the platform we're on right now. And you will get a chance to engage with our presenters using widgets. Now, the reason we're doing this is that you may be asked to attend a lab cast for one of your modules, and we want to give you a pressure-free way to get familiar before the real thing. So for now, I will hand you over to Dr. Julia Cook. She is not only one of our Open Media Fellows, but also a plant ecologist. And Dr. Mark Hurst, he is a senior lecturer in biology, and he has worked on a wide range of modules across the life and health science curriculum. Over to you two. Thank you, and hello. Uh, it's lovely to have you with us today. Um, as Katrina said, today we want to show you through the Stadium Live platform. This is an OU developed platform that lets us do some things that um, other platforms can't do, specifically in the lab and in the field, and to show you things as well as have a bit more interaction with you than we might otherwise have. So um, welcome to the Open STEM Labs. Um, as Julie's just said, well, we're here to kind of give you a, a tour around uh, Stadium, uh, which is the thing you're looking at in front of you. And there are different components. Um, one of the things about bringing you into labs is that we can use all sorts of different um, items in that little screen in front of you to get you to interact with us today. Mm -hmm. But um, the presenters of the lab casts uh, in, your, in your modules, for example. So today you arrive through a different type of link. Normally you'd be arriving at your lab cast with a link that will be provided in your study planner or somewhere on your module site, it may be on a forum, but you'll be going directly from your module pages uh, to Stadium. And when you get there, one of the things that I think you've already been introduced to um, in the chat line was that um, we have a series of questions that are sat below the screen, below us. They're sort of little boxes that are kind of greeny. If you open the very first one by clicking on it, you'll see a map. And we'd like you to put a dot on the map to let us know where you are, um, where you're watching us from today. And then we'll come back and uh, sell it to various places uh, when we've done that. Brilliant. I can see that people have already um, found various parts and are exploring, which is great to see. Um, so while you're filling out the, the widget, we'll tell you a little bit more about what we're going to do today. We were thinking about what we'd like to show you and how, and it's autumn, um, which for an Australian is very exciting. Uh, so we thought we'd have a bit of an autumn theme, a bit of a colour theme, and use that as a, as a way to just explore a lot of these different widgets and the different, um, different ways that this happens. Um, let's have a look first at this map widget and see how everybody's going. Um, oh, super. We've got people all over England, which is nice and lucky. <laughs> I think we've probably just got a few in Scotland. Yeah, I can definitely see somebody looks like Edinburgh. Mm -hmm. And two from Europe. Um, actually, that's a good point about these live casts is between when we speak and when you see this, one of the great things about Stadium Live is that it optimises your viewing and things, but it does mean there's a little bit of a delay. So what we need to build into these live casts is when we speak to you, we need to leave a bit of time for you to respond and then for that to come back to us. So you will see sometimes that we might be saying something that's a little bit out of sync with what you're seeing because of that little delay. Um, and that's part of live broadcast really but it it comes with that little yeah, feedback yeah yeah it, it makes it more fun for us uh, but might be slightly confusing for you watching <laughs> um so um that first widget is a really good example of uh the widgets in being anonymous so what you could do is click on the map as you can do with all the widgets later on mm -hmm. and we don't know who you are it's a completely non-anonymous way of interacting with your presenters so um don't feel scared, don't feel intimidated. Uh, they'll ask you a whole series of questions like we will today. Have a go and answer in them um, because the whole purpose of LabCast is to bring you into the lab or into the field in, 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 in Julia's case often. So um, in that way, you get involved with doing the experiments. So a very common widget would be to ask you to report something back to us, a bit like your location on a map. So the first experiment of today mm. is to use another map widget and we'd like you to have a go at the second map, but this time we'd like to know a little bit more about autumn. So we'd like you to put a dot on the map if over 80% of the leaves on the trees mm. outside your 
present location um, have actually uh, dropped, off, dropped off the trees. We'd also like you to just um, have a go answering something in the, in the chat line. Um, tell us how autumn's proceeding. We know it's sunny in the, the northeast and uh, <laughs> I think in Yorkshire, but um, have, put something in the chat line to let us know what it's like outside. So you showed us where you were on the map, but we're here in Milton Keynes at the Open University campus and this lab is especially built for broadcast and adapted for that. And we can also show you what it looks like outside. Um, yeah. So we have a camera pointing outside the lab as well. Um, mm, very pretty. Very pretty indeed. I, no, would you say 80% of the leaves have fallen here? I would probably say no. no I, I, I think we're so. in the early autumn, but um, I wouldn't say it's, it's, it's completely... There are lots of leaves on the ground, but not actually very much. Mm, indeed. So it's nice to be able to see outside because we can't just at the moment. <laughs> so if you're going to put something in the chat, it may well be that if you've had frost, for example, or even snow, you know, well, let us know because that's obviously part of what winter. Mm. So, Julie, I guess we should start by talking about a little bit of the science. So why did leaves go orange and red in the autumn? Right. So um, I guess we can start by thinking about why leaves are green in the first place. So um, almost all plants photosynthesize, so they take energy from the sun and they use that to convert carbon dioxide and water into sugars and starches and they use a series of pigments to do that and one of the most common pigment, pigments is chlorophyll and that the wavelengths of light that that uses are uh, multiple ones but the ones that doesn't really use are the greens and so it reflects that back so we see plants as green but that's because they don't really use or need green light and so we see them and associate plants very strongly with green at this time of the year, when the weather's changing and it's becoming cooler, um, the leaves won't fare very well. These thin, thin, flimsy leaves won't fare very well in the winter, so the plants take back the nutrients from them as much as they can and then chuck them away. And so when they take the, uh, the chlorophyll away, that green pigment away, we're left with a whole range of other pigments that were there before, but we couldn't see them because there was so much chlorophyll. And so we see carotenoids and other, um, other pigments that are involved in various functions of the leaf. And so, yes, when the chlorophyll disappears, we get these lovely colours. Okay, so um, before we do a little bit more about leaves, we've been talking about light and energy and how plant leaves absorb energy. So uh, time to introduce a little bit more science. Uh, and if you've seen the poster that's behind us on the board, um, we're gonna, you'll probably encounter this in pretty much most science modules, the electromagnetic uh, spectrum and um, it's a, a form of wave energy, and you're going to be familiar with some of these. We're going to be talking a lot about what we see in the middle of this spectrum of energy, which is called the visible wavelengths. So these, these, these are wavelengths that we, that we interpret as color, and they range from violet through to red. But we have a whole spectrum that goes right way across to things that we're familiar with, with things like gamma rays and x-rays, right the way across through ultraviolet, through the visible spectrum, and then infrared microwaves, and even radio waves. So there's a whole spectrum of energies um, out there, and we're just focusing today on just a little bit uh, in the middle. Mm. Right, let's return to the next widget and see what that came up with in terms of whether 80% of the leaves have fallen in your area. Oh, that's nice, that's what we're hoping for. <laughs> oh, yes, we have a gradient, way, great. That's really nice to see. So we've lost some of the points in the south where it's still warmer and we've got lots of autumn colours and lots of leaf drop more, which is the question actually. It would be really um, nice if the person has put other could tell us where they are in the chat. I'm quite intrigued to know, so uh, <laughs> it would be really, really nice. So if you're in Europe or other, put in the chat line where you are because we're, we're, we're quite interested to know where, where, where autumn is actually happening. Mm. That's good. Brilliant. So we've been talking about colour change and and the colour change that we see in leaves, but can we measure what's happening there and can we measure sort of the impact of that colour? So what I have here is a chlorophyll fluorescence machine and that looks at the, photo, the, the photosynthetic function of, of a particular leaf. And what it does is it, it um, when, when light hits a leaf, the plant can either use that light or in, in photosynthesis, so it can use that light to make sugars and starches or that light dissipates as heat or it fluoresces that light if it's unable to use it back 
into um, back to us or back towards out of the leaf again. So what this machine does is measure that and we can have a look at how much light the plant uses and how much it fluoresces back to understand its photosynthetic capacity. So I'm going to use some ginkgo leaves today. Uh, so we've got a nice green leaf here and a yellow leaf. And I am going to uh, put the green leaf in there and hopefully you can see that now. Um, and what this machine is going to do is it's got a little light on it now and it's measuring sort of some background of, um, of, of fluorescence and then it's going to hit it with a pulse of light and it will compare those two values to give us a measure of the, the quantum photosynthetic yield. It's looking at a particular wavelength um, and that gives us information about one part of the photosynthetic pathway and that's, the, that's photosystem 2 that has a, um, is, is part of the, the chlorophyll or the light dependent reactions in photosynthesis. So I'm going to run the test here. Find my pen. You'll see a little flash of light there. And there we go. And we get a value here of the quantum photosynthetic yield of photosystem 2. And that value is 0 0.710. And that's pretty good. So that's um, a healthy leaf or something that's considered to be um, functioning very well, it has a value of 0.7 or more. Uh, so we, that's, this leaf is going really well even though I've detached it from the plant, it's still functioning really well. Um, we can now have a look at a yellow leaf, but before we do that I want you to predict whether you think um, this will give a photosynthesis yield that's higher or lower than that. So our green leaf was 0.710 do you think this would have a higher value, which would say a higher yield, um, and so the plant is able to use more of the light in photosystem 2, or this first part of photosynthesis, or a lower value and a lower yield? So uh, that's your next uh, widget. Would you like to think if it's going to be higher or a lower yield? So I'll put the leaf in, and we'll come back to that in a minute. OK, so some live measurements going to happen in the lab. So. Um We'll come back. We'll come back and look at uh, look at your answers to that in a minute. But let's just go back to what we were just talking about the the visual spectrum. So um, we've already talked about the color range from kind of violet uh, across to the reds, and we give a wavelength value to those. Or we'll be talking a little bit more of in a minute. But we're going to talk a little bit about, about energy because what Julia has been talking about is the fact that the plants are using the energy that's carried in the light and turning it into energy, uh, chemical energy, and ultimately into the whole plant and everything as well. But, but if we, it'd be quite useful to just think about the, the, the entire spectrum. So we talked about shorter wavelength, um, like gamma rays and X-rays and ultraviolet. Now they carry a lot higher levels of energy. So as you know, a lot of those things can be quite damaging to the body. They will interact with chemicals in the body, cause um, free radicals, but also damage things like DNA in your cells. And everybody who's been exposed uh, to, to too much UV will know the benefit of putting a blocker on because it will kill cells and your skin peels off. As the wavelength increases, um, the energy uh, goes down. Mm. And I, I think an easy way to remember that is if we've got these shorter wavelengths with really high frequency, if you had a skipping rope and yep. we wanted to make that wave, we'd need to put loads and loads of energy in to make, make a rope make those waves. Whereas something like microwaves and, and radio waves that, that are all around us without causing the same levels of damage or any damage, they have much lower, so you would just be, you know, waving a very... <laughs> I do like that. It's a very visual way of remembering it. I, it I, is. I think that's brilliant. It is. So we're, but this machine measures about here in the red spectrum, so it's looking for light being fluoresced back from this photosystem. So let's have a look at that next widget and see whether you thought it would be a lower yield or a higher yield. Okay. A <laughs> very, <laughs> no very fooling, clear No response. fooling these guys. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. I think, I think you're on the right track there, which is fantastic. Um, so I've got the yellow leaf now. Ginkgo, it's from the same tree in this machine, and I'm going to run the same test again on a different leaf. And we wait for a little minute while it flushes. And you can see the value here, the yield for photosystem 2, is 0.547. So you are spot on, 0.547. So that's saying the amount of light that this leaf is able to take in and use is a lot lower than that green leaf. So we can see that as the leaves change colour, 
their photosynthetic capacity is reducing a lot. Okay, so uh, great. So well done for, uh, I think everybody you got that uh, prediction <laughs> prediction right. So it's uh, pretty, you, pretty impressive. Yeah, do you think people also worked out they could change their mind too? Uh, probably, yeah. I didn't, see anybody, <laughs> I didn't see anybody changing right at the last minute, but um, I guess actually we've got uh, Katrina who's been monitoring questions on the chat. So um, have we got uh, some questions that we want to answer, Katrina? Uh, we do actually. Um, Karen has asked, would the fluorescence value be higher in the summer? Oh, that's a really good question. And the answer is, as it usually is in science, it depends. So one of the things that people use chlorophyll fluorescence to measure is stress. So I would imagine it, for this ginkgo, in the summer when the leaves were newly expanded, if there was lots of water and conditions were fantastic, I would expect that quantum yield to be higher, unless there was a drought and there wasn't much rain and that plant was really stressed and then we would see those values fall. So it really depends on the stress levels of the plant and, and actually people use it to measure crop stress and identify patches of the crop that might be stressed and need extra nutrients or more water and things like that. So yeah, that's a great question. Great. Um, and I've got one. I've been a student with the OU before and like, like other students, lots on right now. So what happens if you can't watch a LabCast live? Do you want to take that one? Okay, so most of the LabCasts will be uh, recorded. Uh, so the first thing is that if you don't, if you missed, we encourage you to go to the live ones because you have much more fun. You also can answer the widgets live and take part in all of that science, uh, which is great. But um, all of them will be recorded. Um, basically, you'll be able to go to a replay of the LabCast. Pretty much instantaneously, it will be available through the same link uh, that's advertised uh, that you, we go to the live event. And then occasionally, some modules will archive them in a, in a, a particular area, maybe in the Open Science Laboratory or on a module website, for example. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's a great question because we know most, uh, a lot of students won't be able to make a live event. That's it for now, yeah. Okay. Super. So I was looking at one single wavelength, and this machine in that particular test to look at chlorophyll fluorescence looks at one wavelength. But lots of other things measure or look at lots of wavelengths at the same time. Yeah, so it's a very pretty common to, to measure uh, uh, electromagnetic radiation of different wavelengths, and depending upon your discipline, you may be interested in particular aspects. So um, we're going to do a, an, a little bit of an experiment of two experiments today, but uh, the first one uh, is, is going to be using some of this stuff you can see lying around. So the first thing I should say is that um, we're in the Open STEM laboratories um, and it's a laboratory environment. Um, why haven't I got gloves and lab coats on? But um, what we're doing today is we're going to be looking at things that are just commonly found in your household. So, so non these are non-hazardous substances. <laughs> Um, we, we'll be looking at a bit of mouthwash and then some, some beverages of various varieties. So uh, none of this is, uh, is, is hazardous in any way. So don't usually hurt you. No, nah, so, so that, that's why we're not wearing uh, lab coats and gloves. So actually what we're going to be talking about is, um, we've talked about the, the visual range, but actually um, it's, um, describing it as a colour is uh, quite subjective. Um, and actually, there are much more precise ways of analysing colour, which don't depend upon you describing what you see. And one of those is to measure um, uh, the light that's absorbed or reflected uh, based upon uh, the, the wavelength. So what I've got here, you should be able to see here, is a sample which is, um, hopefully you can see, um, to my eyes at least, is uh, green. It's in a it's in a completely transparent plastic container, so all you can probably see is the actual green colouring itself. It's actually mouthwash, uh, so commonly used to kind of, uh, after you brush your teeth, uh, give your mouth a quick wash, and it's, uh, you probably recognise a nice green colour. So um, what I'm going to do is actually take it across and use this instrument sat next to me that's called a spectrophotometer. And hopefully you can follow me across, and what we have is... Um, ready to measure, what I'm going to do is I'm going to place, place this um, sample um, into uh, a sample holder in the instrument. It has a lid and I'm going to close because that's going to be dark. And what's going to happen is the instrument will fire light through the sample. Hopefully if I push that button, if I push that button it should run. 
Nope, it needs to collect the baseline sample first. So it's gonna go back and actually do, what it's doing now is it's going back and just collecting what it's called a baseline sample. So that is just removing any background absorbance. Mm -hmm. You can hear it probably click away if I lean a little bit closer. It's a very satisfying machine actually in terms of making reassuring noises. Yeah, it's uh, strange it makes reassuring noises sometimes that uh, it shouldn't <laughs> be doing, but never mind. So um, what it's doing is it's actually firing light through, in this case, a blank sample. So this is just a sample of water or a little bit of alcohol in it because it's a mouthwash. And what it's gonna do is just take off all of the values that are just coming from the plastic cuvette the sample's in and any kind of a background sort of matrix. So that is gonna go through and when it's finished clicking, it shouldn't draw a graph with a bit of a look. It'll just uh, give, give us a blank line. I can see it's almost finished. And that is our blank sample done with a bit of luck. So now I can actually run our sample. If I press it to go, hopefully this will now start firing in the same cuvette. So we've already measured background that's coming from the plastic and the, and the chemicals in the background. And what it's doing is it's going nanometer by nanometer by nanometer from about 700 down to 400 nanometers. It's firing a known amount of light through and it's measuring how much comes out the other end, how much is actually being absorbed by the substance. And what you can see is a little graph, a little peak. What it will do is, like all good science instruments, when it finishes, it'll readjust the vertical axis. So what you'll see is the graph will get bigger. There we go. So what this is doing is plotting absorbance on the vertical scale. And what you can see is a peak of absorbance so what I've done here on the bottom is actually put up a little color bar. And this is actually the colors as your eyes perceive it. So actually the, the, the color your eyes perceive is dependent upon um, the biology of your eyes and also of the biology of your brain. So they don't quite correspond with the colors we think of the visual spectrum. But what you can see is our peak of absorbance here. This solution is mostly absorbing colors that appear to be red to our eyes, it's not absorbing very much light that we perceive to be blue or green, which is why we see it as a greeny blue solution. Mm. So I'm going to repeat this, but this time I'm going to put a second sample in. Cover your eyes, I'm not going to look either. And I'm going to make sure that <laughs> nobody can see the sample as I put it in. I'll do it very, very quickly. I'm going to pop that sample in and close the lid. And I'm going to ask it to rerun the scan. So it's gonna do exactly the same scan as it did before. Nanometer by nanometer by nanometer. It's gonna plot that. You can see a little bit of a, a baseline if you look, if we can see the screen. Um, you can see there's a little bit of a, a peak. It's because the instrument doesn't know how much it's gonna be absorbing. It always just records a value. When it's finished, it'll rescale. So what I'd like you to do is look at the absorbance profile and let me know what color do you think that sample was? What I should say is, it's another household item. Okay, so it <laughs> regraph itself, there we go. So we've got a nice big graph of absorbance. Um, so have a go on the next widget um, and tell us what color you think that sample is. Okay. Great, so while you're thinking about that, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the field cast. So, um, I'm in the lab today, but usually uh, I'm actually out in the field. So we take all of the kit and caboodle that we use for the field casts outside and, um, and so we can do some field investigations. And the, the, the point of that is to demystify doing a field investigation because it's, there's a lot of decisions to be made uh, from making observations to choosing your hypothesis to, um, to sorting out how to how to take the samples you need to address your hypothesis and doing the analysis. So we use those sort of decision points to let you drive um, the field cast and you to make the decisions. Um, so we're out on the Open University campus and you, I think we can put up a picture, you can see us there. This particular field cast was on a nice sunny day, but we have had um, several where it's been raining and very windy and I can assure you that the cameras get the raincoats rather than the presenters. But they're really good fun, we, we do really enjoy them. Um, and each year students have chosen to do completely different investigations. Um, and uh, what else can I tell you about the field casts? 
they're, I think they're just lots, lots of fun, really. Actually, I know what's important about them. In that particular module, they form part of the assessment. So um, it's mandatory to, to view the field casts because you need some of the information, the data that are in them. But um, the TMA mark doesn't depend on whether you attend live or watch the recording. And the feedback we've had from students is that the, the live versions are really fun and, and, and good, but that the students who watch the recordings also enjoy that, that their peers made the decisions and sort of the, the kind of banter and, and generally the things that go wrong when you do field work. So you've seen that there's recordings are always available if you can't make it live. Um, I guess lots of modules also run forums alongside mm. them where students can ask additional questions and things like that? Yes, our field cast um, come, has, a, has a, uh, a forum that runs parallel to that and yes, there are lots of forums and students who were there live help students that weren't or students that watch the recordings remind students that watch them live. So there's, um, yes, I think that they're always well supported. And there's the always forum. the excitement that something can go wrong. Which something is, uh, always goes wrong. <laughs> always fun. <laughs> So maybe we should check back and uh, see what see what's happened with our colour experiment. Yes. So, so uh, yes. you saw earlier that we the we did the scan. Okay. So uh, we asked you what colour. I can see that pretty much most people have uh, opted for the right end of the spectrum. If we can maybe just cut back to the the image, what you can see is you can see that peak of absorbance suggests that that solution is absorbing a lot of the light in the blues, the greens, and into the yellows, and that actually what's left is gonna be the stuff that's reflected is very much in the reds, and I can, I can see into the oranges as well. So yes, yeah, so, so well done everybody. That's a, a really good example. And obviously it removes the subjectivity, and measuring uh, the wavelength of light uh, in compounds is really commonly used in a lot of modules not just uh, in a lab in these types of instruments, but uh, other ways pointing things out to sp uh, space, yes. for example. Are you going to show us what colour it is? Oh yeah, I should show you what colour it is, <laughs> just to prove it. I completely forgot this. I should reach out, yeah, the big reveal, if I can find it, is, drum roll, drum roll, drum roll. There we go. Hopefully we can get a close up. It's mm. a nice pinky, pinky red. red. So, is, that, yeah. is that another mouthwash? That's another mouthwash. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I didn't want to say that initially because I think they only come in a few colours. Yeah, I don't. Probably so. Wouldn't, yes. wouldn't, wouldn't have given it away. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> so we talked a lot about colour mm. and its measurement, um, but um, I guess it's used a lot in other areas of science. So we'd like you to have a think about where else you might encounter colours, or wavelength, or the measurements of uh, wavelengths in science. Uh, could well be that you're already. Studying science, I can see, for example, we've got at least uh, somebody who's a level three physics student, so mm. you must have encountered lots of things with wavelength. Uh, the next little widget is what we call a Wordle widget. So mm. you've actually got to put in three different words that you think yeah. uh, you areas might encounter in science. And to show you that, I thought we'd do that now too. Okay. Um, so I think we can cross to my screen, and I'm going to make the, uh, the Wordle screen large so you can see it hopefully. Uh, so where might you encounter colour in science. Um, I talked to a lot of people about animal behaviour, so I'm going to say animal behaviour because uh, animals choose mates and things based on um, their... Oh, I just lost that. Sorry, folks. Um, animal behaviour. So this is a widget where you have to put in your three words and then enter, enter, don't you? Yes. As well. Okay. So help me out. Three words is a lot. <laughs> well, I would say, you know, a lot of geologists spend their time sort of cracking rocks and looking at colour, so I'd go for minerals. Okay. Minerals. Easier to spell. Katrina, number three. Ooh. Let's literally go out of this world and say space. <laughs> Space, okay. You're thinking black holes and red dwarfs and things like that, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, Definitely. I think that's a nice yeah. example of kind of quite specific answers and, and broad answers. This yeah. is, there's no right or wrong answers here. Um, and then when we hit enter, we'll be able to see um, all the different things that everyone else has put in. And I think that's a really nice thing about the Stadium Live platform is, is you make your decision or um, input or contribution and then you can see everybody else's and yours fits in with, with everyone else's and it's part of it. You can see whether you were part of the 50% who voted this way or that way. And I know at least in the field cast, for lots of things there's no wrong answer. It's about people making a choice. But then sometimes there's questions about 
statistics when there when there is a right and a wrong answer. So it's it's about learning really. So uh, I guess we can just have a quick check back with chats. Katrina, is there any questions to address? There is actually, and it's going back to colours of leaves. Uh, new young leaves of some plants are red. Is this because these do not absorb red visible light, and why? Uh, yes, it's because the dominant pigment doesn't absorb red light. Um, and that can be for a variety of reasons. Sometimes the leaf is sort of investing in building the leaf and things before it puts all the chlorophyll in and starts functioning. Um, sometimes those compounds that appear red are, are protective compounds, so they're tannins and phenols and things that taste terrible, and so they're protecting the leaf and so they can appear red. Um, there's probably, sometimes they're about protecting the leaf from sun damage, so sometimes if there's very bright lights and there can be um, uh, um, lots of free radicals and things in the leaf. They'll have uh, pigments that will take care of those. So there can be a whole range of reasons why leaves are red and young leaves are red. But they're often just as beautiful as autumn leaves. That's a nice question. That's a very nice question. Thank you for asking that. Maybe just quickly check back with the widget. Now people have had a chance mm. to think of three words to put on the wordle. Uh, oh, yeah, lots more words. OK. Oh, so, I like it. Oh, D block elements. Yeah. <laughs> Super remote observation. Oh, that's a nice one. Yeah, using using sort of satellite imagery um, to measure and different cr aspects like chromatography, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, literally does mean color. So yes. wonderful. Yeah. So more animals, lots of space, lots of things in there. Blood, looking at oxygenation and things. I yeah, guess. patterns of oxygen. Yeah, loads of things. Good and a really good range across uh, all areas of um, science as well. So that's really nice. Good. But I can see pH in there. Yeah, I can see pH. Hasn't capitalised the H because our world no, which, doesn't capitalise. Which gives us a little bit of a <laughs> sort of feeling. <laughs> but yeah, that's a, that's a really good way into th thinking about our next little practical demonstration. So um, we're going to be talking a little bit more about colour, but a slightly different aspect of colour. You've probably, maybe if you're a gardener or you've certainly done any kind of chemistry in a lab, have come across uh, pH papers. So these are little uh, papers that are sensitive to um, uh, this, the pH of a substance. So we think about the pH of a substance indicating its acidity or its alkalinity. And we put it on a scale I'll talk a little bit more about later. But what we're going to do is an observation experiment. So we're going to stick a little bit of this test pH paper into some lime juice. So this is just lime juice that's sat around in the, the fridge at home. And what we're going to do is uh, dip this in. And so what this um, strip has on it are four little panels uh, that are sensitive uh, to pH. But each of them is sensitive to a different type of pH. I'm just going to leave it in there just, to, just for a little bit longer. And what happens is that they will change colour depending upon the pH of the solution. So I'm going to take it out now and hopefully if you were very observant to start with when it went in you'll have noticed that those strips, those four little strips, have actually now changed colour. So um, they've changed colour in different ways. Some of them have changed more and some of them haven't changed at all. So what I'd like you to do is an observation experiment. So we like what I'm going to do is put this next to a scale and have you interpret the colour. So I need to just walk over here where we've got a camera close up. What I'm going to do is hold that strip. Okay, so that's the strip that you've just watched, you've just seen. And as I said, so pH is, um, we use a scale from 0 to 14, where the lower numbers indicate an acid and the higher numbers an alkali. So what you do to estimate pH using a pH strip is to simply look for colours that match. So if we go all the way across to alkali, what we're asking you to do is interpret the colours that you see um, based upon the dip four different panels, you see that some have changed colour and others haven't, and interpret what the pH of that uh, lime juice is. What I'll do is I'll leave that in the middle so you can see it a little bit longer and have a go interpreting that colour on the next widget, which should be um, easy enough to find and there are five options uh, depending upon uh, how you interpret the different panels and the colours that those panels have changed. And I think 
we try and make these um, the options for you quite realistic. So here we haven't asked you to guess exactly what um, pH it might be, but to give you a bit of a range because people see colours differently and um, yeah. the, they come through a bit differently on screens and things as well. And those four boxes seem a little bit mysterious, don't they? They're sort of just colours that change, but actually these have come have been derived from from things that are rel relatively no. What word do I want? Well, they're, they're nearly all derived from plants yes. originally. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the classic example is uh, if you're a gardener out there and you've got uh, blue hydrangeas in the back garden and red hydrangeas in the front garden, mm. it's probably because the pH of the soil is different, for example. Yes, and you might have either as a child or an undergrad or a school project um, made your own pH indicator using um, cabbage. So you can use the liquid that comes from a red cabbage and that will change in response to um, solutions with different pH. Yeah, and yeah. My favourite one is mulberry juice. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, we had a mulberry tree as a kid and we'd pick them and come out completely red and then we had an alkaline creek um, and we go and wash off in that and turn blue. Wow. So um, You can see why yeah. you're an ecologist yes. now. Yes, yeah. <laughs> a whole body yeah. pH. The, the mulberry and the pH was uh, directed <laughs> you from a young age. So you came into the Labcast today and we didn't ask you to prepare for anything. So um, interesting, how would you ask students to prepare for your field casts? Um, with... Not, not very much really, um, which is quite nice. We, I guess the most important thing is to turn up and participate. Uh, it's great if you're up to date with the module materials, but that's, that's really true for anything. And you know, we all are sometimes ahead, we're sometimes behind. And it's nice to have been, know where the links are, know what time everything is and have all of that in your calendar. To be there a few minutes early so that you don't miss the start if you need to refresh or something because this is, this is quite a cool platform but it does come with lots of different strands of information. Um, a notepad's useful to make some notes but the recordings are there. But I guess just to, to come along and participate, as, as we said earlier, you need some of this information for assessments but the recordings are always there so it's, it's sort of just about listening and learning and, and getting involved. What about lab casts? A similar way, really. Some of them are used in assessments. Um, certainly it's useful to kind of uh, have a little bit of a check just to wh where, you, where you are in the module because they'll often be related to some aspect, a topic you're studying or something like that, or a technique or an instrument or something like that. But you don't normally have to bring anything with you other than somewhere to write notes, somewhere to write down data, and of course the old brain so you can interact with uh, things like the interactive questions. Mm. Some of the lab casts will also be priming you for um, an interactive experiment you may be doing in the open STEM labs or even using a remote instrument. So you may well be actually having a briefing with the instrument sat in the lab, being shown how it works, and then you'll be going in later as part of your module to use that specific instrument uh, over the internet uh, to study it. So, uh, but in all these cases, as we've already said, the recordings are always available and uh, usually th th they're a great place to just go back and find out all the information. I guess it's probably time to check in with our pH uh, quiz. So how were your powers of observation? So yeah, so um, most people have gone for the pH 0 to 3, um, uh, but we've got a group who've gone the opposite direction, very alkaline. So um, that's probably because the colors are opposite ends of the spectrum mm. that actually, uh, so maybe we could just flick back onto the actual uh, uh, pH paper. So. If I move it across to the alkaline, you can see that um, the, the bottom panel um, really doesn't match and there's none of the, the middle panels. Um, it's much more similar to the ones at the acid end of the spectrum. So in fact, I would have probably myself gone for something in, in that kind of area. So um, the bottom panel being a similar kind of color. So, Probably the, the 0 to 3. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty certain that lime juice isn't pH 0, cause, uh, but we all know it's got a bit of an acidic tang because we've all drunk the odd cocktail with uh, a, bit of, uh, a, a bit of lime juice yes, in to a certain just, extent. You know, lemon juice on, on fish or a salad or anything like that. It's quite, tastes quite yeah, acidic. So Don't think I'm, about. I'm just going to very quickly put on stage here. Oh, um, yes. Because we, what we like to do is, Julia's already mentioned that what often happens in field casts is you get asked what to do next. So we mm. thought we'd try and recapitulate that. So I've got a few samples here um, of things that you'd, you would find at home. In fact, some of you may even have some in front of you. I have some tea, I have some coffee, and I have some washing up liquid. 
And simple question is, what, which of those would you like to know the pH of? So this is you deciding what experiment we do next. So there's a widget for that. Um, do you want us to check the pH of coffee, tea, or washing up liquid? Great. There we go. All right. And while you're making that decision, having a think about it, we have a nice opportunity today to take you behind the scenes of the field cast. So usually it's all about us, all the cameras are facing us, and, and, and you see us because we're, we're teaching you and interacting with you. But we wanted to show you what's on the other side of the cameras today because we can't do this alone. There's, there's sort of two people on screen, but there's people behind the screens as well. So we can first uh, say hello to Ben, who's behind the cameras. Uh, so we can switch Hello, to that ben. camera. <laughs> He's capable of magic, this man. So you can also see Katrina on the chat box there, and you can see us um, with all our bits of equipment and scripts and machines and things, and you can just see a bit of an overhead camera in the front there as well. Um, yes, that Ben pointed to. <laughs> And we can also show you the edit suite uh, where you can say hello to Kate. Um, and I wrote down, there she is. And so she's choosing which of the streams that you can see live and making sure that you can hear us clearly. Um, she said she's got 12 feeds to choose from today. So between the outside camera, all the ones on our bits of equipment and, um, and all of the widgets and it's linked into my laptop. So there's, um, she's also capable of what appears to be to be magic. Omega, you actually got to see her push the button as we twitch back to the lab view. <laughs> Super. So there you go, that is a real behind the scenes kind of look, isn't it? So um, yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, uh, it's uh, good to see it. And, uh, yeah, it is. You see there's a lot of people involved. Um, let's go back and check what um, experiment you want us to do. Mm -hmm. So we asked you, which of these would you like to know the pH of? And you know, I would have thought if people would go for coffee. So yeah, it looks <laughs> as if the majority of people want us to check the tea. So, okay. That's great. So, the tea will be, but before we do that, we actually want you to, as you selected tea, tell us what pH you think the tea oh, will be. Yes. So we have one more widget, which is um, the last of the range of widget, which is a scale widget. And we'd like you to suggest what pH tea will be. Mm. And I'm gonna give you a little steer that it's very unlikely to be two or 14 because <laughs> I certainly wouldn't drink it if it was at that range. And um, then we can we, we'll actually uh, check, check the pH. Mm. And so each of the intervals on that scale is, is sort of a pH value. So two, three, four, five, six, up to 12 or something was on the, 13 is on the scale. So what we've tried to do today is take you through all the different types of widgets we have available. So um, this, is, this is the last type that you might encounter really in, um, in field casts or lab casts. Um, so what? I guess um, we've talked a lot about how subjective color is and you know, look, looking at color of pH strips and things like that. So what we've actually got here is something to make it a little bit more analytical. So this is a, uh, a sensor that will detect the pH of a substance. And here's my T. And what I'm going to do is, um, so we're actually going to put a, a numerical value using a digital instrument. I'm just going to drop that in. We'll shake around because sometimes there's kind of bubbles in there. And um, what we can do is it'll take a little bit to equilibrate and then we'll be able to look at what the actual value is. But maybe before then we should just go see what you predict the value is going to be. That's a nice normal distribution. <laughs> it is, okay. So we need to interpret the little scale on the bottom now. Yeah, so it's changing as we go along. So seven, the X is on seven, I think. I think um, it is seven. With a, with a kind of a bit of a bias towards the alkaline, alkaline end. Mm. Are, are we all finished voting? You can see it's changing as, uh, as people vote. Anybody else feel it's more alkaline or more acidic? Oh, we've gone for somebody who's really jumped in just to, to, just to upset the apple cart and gone down to four. <laughs> so, OK, maybe we should have a, a quick check of the actual meter. So this little sensor is hooked up to a meter and that's going to report the digital readout. So that is the pH of black tea, at least as it's served here at the Open University. And that's giving a pH of 5.9. So actually more acidic than the neutral, but mm. that's not going to strip your tongue off if, no. you, if you drank too many cups of it, <laughs> thankfully. <laughs> so there you go. That's an example of you uh, directing us to do a particular experiment. And um, 
doing and it. So there you go, you now know the pH of uh, black, black tea is 5.9. And actually that's quite a nice link back to the leaves we began with, isn't it? Because the tea is made of tea leaves. It's um, yeah. a camellia species and we pick the leaves and dry them and then soak them in hot water and drink it. Uh, and it's the, it's the tannins um, and some of the protective compounds that, that we like the taste of that as a, other animals find distasteful and can be um, unpleasant to some, but we've made tea that we like. Yeah, so uh, good example. So um, we're almost coming to the end, so it's probably worth us just thinking back of a couple of things we've highlighted. We've highlighted the fact that things like the widgets are completely anonymous, that you can go in there, put, it, put in a response to, to the presenters mm -hmm. and uh, interact with them and not feel any pressure uh, or anything, or the embarrassment about choosing the wrong, the wrong answer and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, some of you may have already uh, received an email about this, but um, what you can do before you enter a Labcast is you can change your profile as it appears on the chat. So the chat can be completely anonymous. To do that, you need to, before you enter, up on the top right hand side of the little thing, there's a thing that says my profile. You can go in there and change your profile before you then press enter. And then whatever name you put in there will appear in the chat. So it can be completely, completely anonymous. Mm. So you've had a go at a range of widgets. I think we've covered all of the type of widgets. I think so. And hopefully it means you're sort of familiar with the layout and, and sort of what to expect and that it's a bit more kind of laid back and interactive than, than perhaps some other tutorials, although I'm sure there's lots of interactive tutorials as well. Um, but it is a slightly different setup and hopefully this now makes you feel a bit more familiar with using them. And as you saw, they're actually live. You could see that last one was moving around as people were sort of uh, <laughs> speculating on the last pH. So uh, and somebody jumped on the acid scale very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. So um, we've had a couple today. We've had observational data. We've had prediction data. We've had interpretation data. They're all examples of uh, what makes a Labcast fun and interactive by watching them live. Mm, and I think, um, you know, it's just nice to be able to respond to, to what you're thinking and, and, and what you're understanding. So if there's, um, you know, we saw a divided response where people have gone for both scales so we can spend a bit more time on that and explain a little bit further because we can see that people have different understandings or we can see that everybody's in agreement and we're all on the same page and power on through. So I really like this platform as a way to, to respond to the students that are participating and, and make sure we can sort of accelerate your learning. So I guess we should just check back and see whether there's any more questions come in, Katrina? Yeah, we've had a couple come in at the end here. Um, when you were mentioning how cabbage could be used for testing pH, Tori's also let us know that it works with butterfly PT. It's used a lot in cool drinks. Mm. Oh, so that's maybe that's a bit like um, colour change gin. Um. <laughs> oh, right, okay. Yeah, I wouldn't know. Wouldn't know. I have a friend in New Zealand who's found a, a plant in New Zealand, a native New Zealand plant, that changes colour when you add tonic. And so she's developing her own line of gin. Now, I don't know if that's a pH change or if that's a, a, a colour change in response to some other parameter. Maybe we'll do that in another lab cast. Yes. Any excuse to get some gin in the lab and test it out, <laughs> that'll be good fun. Right, so we've got some science-based questions here right. for you, if, if you're ready for it. Does gravity have any effect on photosynthesis? Oh, uh, well, that's sort of outside my area, but I can, I can sort of think about it. I would say if you're in a non-gravity situation, the gravity bit would be the least of your troubles. Um, so I think, um, you know, if you're in space or something, it would be getting enough light and enough light of the, the right wavelengths to power photosynthesis would be a bigger problem. And then for the plant to, to know which way to grow would be the issue. So whether you know, most plants grow towards the light, but plants also um, send roots downwards in response to gravity. So I think plants might struggle knowing which way to grow. But in terms of photosynthesis occurring, the photosynthesis apparatus, I would guess gravity wouldn't be the biggest limiting factor and I think things like cosmic rays that might damage the photosynthetic parameters might be the biggest thing so I wouldn't say it would be the most limiting thing for photosynthesis but I'm a very much a terrestrial <laughs> um, plant ecologist so that's that's an educated guess. Interesting you could think of an experiment that might test that 
So uh, pop that in the chat line. We actually used to do that on a module a few years ago, which was to propose experiments. And one of the projects was to propose experiments to do on Mars if you were trying to grow food, for example. That right. would be a, a, a type of uh, experiment you might want to. And, and you might be able to test it. So there's a company that um, puts balloons up into space now. Ah, yeah. Um, so people can pay to go on sort of a joy ride into, not into space, but into the sort of upper layers of the atmosphere. And they're calling for experiments to do so. So I can already see Julia with her box of chlorophyll <laughs> monitoring tricks going up in a large balloon, holding a leaf, saying, is yes. it changing, is it changing, is it changing? <laughs> That's great. That's a great question. <laughs> right. I've got... I've got one more question for Julia, and then I have a couple questions for you, Mark. So, Julia, how do we explain leaves of some plants that are green on top and purple or maybe red mm. underneath? Oh. I don't think I've ever thought about that question. Um, uh, so I could imagine this again this is an educated guess because it's not something I have thought about but I would imagine plants are considering where they're investing their green chlorophyll pigment so if there is a thick and heavy leaf um, that light doesn't penetrate the whole way through perhaps it doesn't have chlorophyll on the bottom because there's no light getting to that and the light being reflected up is too low so these might be understory plants that aren't getting any light on the underside of that leaf and so they're putting all the chlorophyll that they have uh, in the top and so it's the other pigments and the other compounds um, that are showing through at the bottom because they're not being masked by so much green um, green pigment or pigment that reflects green light. So that would be my That's guess. That's really interesting. I'm going to throw in a bit from a biology perspective, yeah. which is the, the visual systems of certainly most mammals and things that will eat leaves is very, very attuned to, to, to green because obviously a lot of herbivores will live off trees. <laughs> I, I wonder whether some of the, 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 the choice of, of the, the colours that leaves end up with may also be something to do with looking less attractive to things that want to munch on them, perhaps, yeah. I suppose. Yeah, advertising that they taste terrible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, interesting. Yes, that's a good question. I think we could test that. So if we went to an area with low light, so not lots of light coming in underneath, there might be more leaves with purple underneath. So if you went to a rainforest and the understory plants had purple underneath, that would support my theory. Oh, you need to introduce a goat or something like that as well <laughs> to see, see, see whether or not it would chump on the ones that were green on both sides or maybe. so. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, great question. Yes. Right, Mark is... Alkaline water, really good to drink every day. Ooh. Well, I think anything that you actually take through your mouth is going to immediately hit your stomach, uh, which is very, very acidic. So I would have thought unless you're putting in something that's really, really alkaline, it's not really going to have much of an effect um, in terms of any type of pH. I suspect a lot of the alkaline waters, though, have got uh, salts and dissolved minerals in them, and that's possibly where people are claiming health benefits but um it's not really an area i know a huge amount about but my guess would be it's probably the the alkalinity is coming from some type of mineral or salt that's dissolved mm. in the water so maybe it's the 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 ions or anions or cations in it that that maybe is influencing it but i don't think the ph would have much to do with it brilliant um all right we'll take one more science question, and then we've got a couple about where to find tutorials and lab casts. So, Emilio, um, I'm guessing the question is, does the capacity of photosynthesis depend on the outdoor temperature? Yes, yes, very much so. Um, I think so there's lots in so photosynthesis is really complex um, there are lots of different parts to it lots of different proteins lots of different enzymes and lots of different reactions that happen and these reactions um, occur faster at different temperatures when it's too hot they can you know it can degrade the proteins and things or slow down the reactions when it's too cold the same thing so there's sort of an optimum temperature for these reactions to happen um, and, but plants are adapted to, to different things. So plants have different photosynthetic um, systems to, to manage that in a way. So different parts of the photosynthetic reactions will happen at different part, times of the day. So you might have heard of um, CAM, which is 
crassulation acid metabolism, I think. Mm. Um, and that's where plants do some of the reactions during the day and some of the re reactions at night because of water availability and temperature and things. So yes, temperature really affects um, photosynthesis. Also plants, uh, because they, to get the carbon dioxide they need um, to, to fix, <laughs> to make these sugars and starches, comes through opening the pores in the leaves, so opening the stomata. When that happens, CO2 comes in, but also water is lost. And so in very hot, dry conditions, plants may uh, determine that it's, it's not advantageous to open those stomates and lose so much water. So although it might be an okay temperature for photosynthesis, those stomates will stay closed and there's no CO2 and photosynthesis won't happen because the water loss um, is, is too much for that plant in those dry conditions. So, um, and how much water loss depends on temperature. So it's a really complicated in interaction and plants really respond to the environmental conditions as well as the conditions that they've evolved to. Lovely. Right. Um, we've only got a couple of minutes left, but Mark, I'm hoping you can help. If I missed a lab cast and I'm watching the recording and I've got questions, who can I ask those questions? Where do I ask those questions? Okay, so I think we've mentioned that you'd be able to find the lab, the recordings on the same link and then sometimes on your module site, but um, virtually all of the lab casts will, will be associated with a forum on your module. Um, sometimes it will be on a specific forum that may be linked to an experiment, for example, or a piece of assessment, there's probably a specific forum that may exist, but otherwise it will often just be a post on the module-wide forum, um, and it will be being looked after by, often the presenters will be there, um, sometimes immediately afterwards to answer questions that came up straight away that weren't asked in the chat, uh, but they'll normally be monitored by everybody from your tutors to module team members. So the best place to go is to your module forum, um, if there isn't a specific thing that's linked with assessment or an activity, that's, that's the place to, to ask more questions. Mm -hmm. I, can, I can spot some other questions too about when field casts occur and where to find information about them. And I think the answer's es essentially the same. Look for a forum that's about that or, or you know, ask your tutor for more information so that you do find those links in good time and, and can participate live. Um, in Ben's asked what time of the day they happen. We have our field casts on a Saturday, so we have two, we have a half hour one, and then we have a cup of tea, and then we have another half an hour one, and during that cup of tea time, we also run around and collect the equipment based on the decisions the students made in the first place. So sometimes we have to run off and get trowels or an extra pH meter or something. <laughs> and so we have two on a Saturday, and then we have a data um, field cast during the week. Um, in the evening, so we have sort of daytime and evening ones. I don't know when yours most are. Lab, most lab casts will happen, generally they tend to be evening, mm -hmm. um, but they can happen any time of the day. And uh, you usually find out about them on your module. Um, they'll generally on the study planner, occasionally they crop up on the tutorial planner, and lab casts, oh, lab casts like this one, uh, were because were, they're general, uh, would be posted probably on things like uh, news, news threads and things like that, or on the faculty's own STEM uh, social media profiles and things like that. Yeah. I think we're, we're out of time, so we'll, we'll stop talking, but hope to see you on a field cast or a field uh, lab cast soon. Thank you very much for watching. Enjoy the lab casts on your modules. And I would like to thank Mark and Julia for a very fun and low pressure way to get to grips with Stadium Live. I know I've learned some things that I'm definitely going to try out the cabbage thing in my garden next summer. So make sure you keep in touch with us. Check out your subject sites. We post a lot of upcoming events and news items. Also follow us on our social media pages. On Twitter, you can find us at OU underscore STEM, S-T-E-M, and search for us on Facebook with the Open University Faculty of STEM. Now, Student Voice Week is coming up in a couple of weeks, so make sure you head to those social channels to find out what events are on, because the floor is truly yours. We hope you'll join us for some of those events, and we look forward to seeing you at the next one. Thank you.